our poetic uh, rivalry called uh, no ki wa tabuk si aku yeah 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 Yeah. Oh, doesn't get out of money. She has yet to see a cat. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to PMP Live. I'm Alan Watke, an event coordinator with Politics and Prose. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us in this virtual format in the midst of these extraordinary times throughout all of which we strive to continue to bring you the authors you love and their new books to the politics and prose community. At any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat and I will enter, um, enter the perfect nine, a link to that to where you can purchase it on the politics and prose website. Um, it's, it is your purchases of these books that are keeping us going right now. Uh, today, we, we're, you can ask the authors a question by clicking on the Q and A link which can be found near the bottom of your screen. Finally, we wanna thank you all for being here with us today. We are so thankful to our family of loyal customers, keeping our business and our spirits afloat. And now I'd like to welcome to PMP Live, Gogiwa Yango, celebrating his new novel, The Perfect Nine, the epic of Gikuyu and Mubi. Uh, one of the leading writers and scholars at work today Gugi was born in Lemuru, Kenya. He is the author of A Grain of Wheat, Weep Not Child, Petals of Blood, as well as A Birth of a, Weave, a Dream Weaver, Wrestling with the Devil, and Minutes of Glory. Gugi Watyango's novels and memoirs have received glowing praise from the likes of President Barack Obama, The New Yorker, The New York Times Book Review, The Guardian, NPR, among others. And he has been a finalist for the Mann International Booker Prize and is annually tipped to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. And he is, uh, he, his books have sold tens of thousands of copies around the world. Um, today, he will be in conversation with his son, Mukoma Wagogi, an associate professor of English at Cornell University and the author of The Rise of the African Novel Politics of Language, Identity and Ownership, the novels Mrs. Shaw, Black Star Nairobi and Nairobi Heat, as well as two books of poetry and his upcoming novel, Unbury Our Dead with Song will be out in May. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so now please welcome to PMP Live, Gogi Watyango and Mukoma Wagogi. Hello gentlemen, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, I think it's the first time I'm moderating my dad. So looking <laughs> forward to it. <laughs> yeah, we have had conversations. Remember? Oh, uh, yeah, not to that, yeah, but uh, but maybe because Alan, Alan, and thank you for the introduction as well. Uh, but he raised the question of the Nobel. Maybe we should start from there. You know, since that's what you know. You can hear me. Oh, shall I unmute? Yeah, no, 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 definitely not unmute because you're already unmuted. Oh, we are muted, eh? Yep. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the Nobel, um, let's start with that since, you know, that was just two weeks ago. I myself was very disappointed, um, but... Um, yeah, the Nobel, uh, it, obviously a Nobel would be, I would welcome it in so far as it would really help in uh, finally uh, uh, putting African languages and other marginalized languages of the globe uh, on the map, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but I also talk a lot about the Nobel of the Heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Nobel of the Heart, I receive that almost daily from my readers from all over the world. Eh? Mm -hmm. And by the Nobel of the Heart is when a reader, uh, say, reads your book and they tell you that your book 
impacted them this or that way. Yeah? Mm. It's very, it's, it makes another feel it is worth uh, spending all the time he spent in writing a book and mm. so on. That's why I call it Nobel of the Heart. And the Nobel of the Heart is also special in this respect that it is very democratic. Mm. It's available to all writers. Okay. So you're saying, so you're saying I also have a Nobel? <laughs> yeah, Nobel of the Heart. Whenever you get it, whenever somebody says, I read Nairobi Heat and it made me <laughs> want to become a detective or something like that, you know, or then that's really very special, right? Because they don't have to say it, but they feel it, it impacted them enough for them to tell you or to tell a writer that their book or their product impacted them in this or that way. Mm -hmm. For me, that has always been very, very special. Yeah. So do you think, oh, so I'm asking this, I hadn't thought about this question before, but um, which doesn't portend well, but um, <laughs> but what do you think about um, the arguments that have been circulating amongst the African trade circles of there have been an African prize that not necessarily competes with the Nobel, but uh, offers the same sort of prestige in terms of recognizing African authors, right? You know, so in that case, you know, part of the argument has been, why would why we keep looking to the West for, for recognition? Why not just have our own prize? Um, and somebody mentioned um, the more Ibrahim prize where he gives, I don't know, like a million dollars to African presidents who, who have agreed to retire. <laughs> like one of the most ridiculous things, but still. <laughs> but still the idea that we can have our own Africa center. Uh, <laughs> He bribes them to retire, huh? okay. entices them, please retire. <laughs> yeah. No, obviously, I mean, as it is, uh, there are really very few prizes for writers, but of course he has won. He doesn't have to compete with the Nobel or not. It'd be just another prize. Uh, and African languages would definitely uh, do with just about any prize. Yeah. Uh, in terms of recognition, really. And call it or literally really a normalization of African languages and mm -hmm. other marginalized languages. Mm -hmm. there's, too, there's too much hierarchy in how we see relationship between languages. Mm -hmm. you know, we think of English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, all the imperial languages or the languages of former colonial empires, you know, as being more of languages than other languages. And it's true. Mukama is still holding a musical instrument. And I think you have several musical instruments. Yeah. Hold on, I'm the moderator, so... Um... No, let me, just, let me just say, I want to make a comparison with language. Oh, okay, I see, okay, yeah. yeah. You know, my feeling is uh, languages are like musical instruments. Each musical instrument has its own unique musicality. Mm -hmm. The piano has its own sound. The guitar the same. They can play the same melody, mm -hmm. but the sound texture is obviously different. And you cannot say that piano is higher than a guitar or let us abolish all other instruments and leave the guitar only or mm. the piano only. Each instrument, however small, has its own musicality mm. and languages are the same. Mm. Even if a language is spoken by only five people, that language has its own unique musicality. Yeah, and, and also, and most of the agriculture and um, ecology. Yeah, the current history, memory, even knowledge system of the area in which that language developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't want to minimize any language. All languages are equally languages. Yeah. But languages can also converse with each other. 
you know, for reasons, translation enables me to read, say, Russian literature or mm -hmm. Greek literature, okay? Yeah. Or it enables me to read Sanskrit literature in translation. Yeah. yeah. That's how languages converse and how that's how they should converse. In that sense, there's no language which is more of a language than any other. Yeah. That reminds me of um, what's his name, Radio Makimu, who used to say, What you know, 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 what you Yes, it's all, yeah, it's, you yeah. Another language. You cannot out beauty a language. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you cannot, yeah, exactly. It's, it's inherent equality of languages. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hierarchy of languages is an imperial system. Yeah. It's an imperial system. It's not, it's, yeah. Anyway, the key thing is that each language can play its own sound system. Yeah. But together, they can play even similar melodies, but the texture will always be different. Yeah. Together, they can also form an orchestra, like musical instruments, you know? Yeah. So we can have conversation among languages and cultures but not on the base of hierarchy. It will be on the base of uh, a network of equal give and take, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. All right, so and, and this gives me a good segue. I'm actually proud of this segue. I'm gonna read you a line and then you can respond. Uh, this is from uh, The Perfect Nine. Okay. Uh, translated from the Ekoyo, original by the author. It, oh. I, it reminded me of uh, there's a time I came to uh, one of your readings uh, way back when the Wizard of the Crow, uh, and you say that your favorite line is seeing that translated from the Ekoyo. Yeah. Know. I always, that line is very, very important to me because it, tell, again, we come back to how languages are convert. And as I said, I, you know, I'm a graduate of English literature. But I've really learned a lot from Greek literature. You know, uh, recently I've been reading uh, Mahabharata, mm -hmm. uh, the epics, Sanskrit epics, very, very important epic. But uh, it's available to me mm -hmm. through translation. Mm -hmm. So also Russian literature. So also, I mean, many uh, Latin American literature, Garcia Marquez is available to me through translation, but it's important he wrote in Spanish, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, he didn't have to write in a coil in order for me to say, ah, you have now written a great book. Yeah. But imperial languages assume that other people, imperial language assume that other languages must cease to be mm -hmm. in order for them to be. You know, okay. in other words, for an imperial language to be, other language must cease to be. And to me, that's uh, is an, is a reflection of the uh, imperial systems we've been living under. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is a good time for us to hear a bit of the, um, of, of, if you want to do a reading from the perfect nine, uh, from the perfect nine, if you want to read, then I'll play a little bit of guitar. Then we'll, you know, we can talk about the passage and we can continue. Yeah. Why don't you put me in mood by playing a bit of Malian blue before I start? Yeah. <laughs> <You're vast. laughs> He's my music inspirer. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll let you guys know calling this song um, question and answer, you know, like it's and then oh. I will tell the tale of a coil and Mombi and their daughters, the perfect nine. Matriarchs of the house of Mombi founders of their nine clans, progenitors of a nation. I will tell of their travels and the countless hardships 
they met on the way. Tremor after tremor, raging from the belly of the earth. Eruptions breaking the ground around them, making the rages quick. The earth tremble as new hills heaved themselves out of the earth and others and others burned their flames flaring skyward and valleys formed deep and wide behind them. When Koyo and Mombi looked back and saw a river of thick red mud moving towards them, they climbed other edges that they neither seemed to free to, in a, they climbed other ridges in it that seemed free of flames. But as they sought to sit down for a much need, needed rest, they saw a big red rock hurtling down toward them, forcing, forcing them back on their heels and down to the plains. Other fires flared up in front of them and again, they were back on their feet, beating a hasty retreat, looking for any place that would offer respite. That's the opening uh, salvo, if you like, of uh, <clears throat> the epic of Iko and Moby. But let me like, explain a bit about, about the background. Mm -hmm. uh, the epic is about the myth of origins of Gikoyo people. In Africa and all over the world, nations, peoples have myths of their origins. The best known is the Jewish one uh, about Adam and Eve, for instance. But many, every community has their myth of origins. With the Gikoyo people of Kenya, and there are many other peoples in Kenya, not only Gikoyo, Gikoyo is just one of several peoples in Kenya. Uh, among the Gikoyo people, uh, we believe or we are told that our origins are in one man, Gikoyo, and one woman, Mombi, who were placed by God on Mount Kenya, otherwise known as by the uh, mountain of the moon, because of its permanent snow on the top. And they were shown the land all around Mount Kenya and they were entrusted with that land to care for it with all the other living beings in that area, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the myth says that uh, when they settled in their place called Mokroene, uh, they had nine daughters. Actually, there were 10, but they didn't count the 10th. So they always said nine, full nine. Okay, mm -hmm. Yuru, the perfect nine. Mm -hmm. So the perfect nine is equal to 10, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the daughters came of age to marry, but there were no, uh, apparently no young men around, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So this, the original myth says he went back to the mountain and asked God or Mwenenyaga, uh, Gai, uh, the, to the supreme giver to bring young men. Mm -hmm. And in, when they woke the following day, there were nine handsome men, mm -hmm. suitors. Now, my question, when I was thinking about the myth, I thought two things. One, uh, if the daughters did not have any brothers, mm -hmm. right? Then obviously it meant that they did everything. They must have known how to build, mm -hmm. how to defend themselves, how to make weapons, how to hunt, cultivate, make things. Yeah, in other words, Theirs was a union of the head, the heart, and hands, the totality. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me 
Wow, these are actually the original feminists, okay? So I was very much aware of the feminist power, okay? Then the other addition I, I noted, the other interpretation was, I said, no, when you call people to talk about anything, any achievement, they don't say they did it themselves. They mm -hmm. always say it's the power of God. God made me or did this for me. So when they say God brought nine young men, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily that he took them physically and planted them. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, right? Yeah. So this is where my interpretation comes in that mm -hmm. uh, I see them uh, what in the epic, I talk about their beauty, mm. which is spread all over the continent. Uh, mm. Young men, whatever they are, are dreaming about this beauty, these beautiful women, okay? And they make the suitors come from all over the continent, okay? But there are too many when they arrive, there are about 99 who arrive at the scene. Mm. So, they are given tasks to go back to the mountain and take a journey back to the mountain mm -hmm. uh, with the girls and to explain the other task. Let me just put it this way. Among the 10 girls, there's one who is very beautiful, but her legs are like, you know, very weak. She mm -hmm. cannot stand on, so she cannot stand on her feet, so to speak. So one of the tasks they are given is to go back to the mountain and uh, pluck a hair that cures all. Mm -hmm. But this hair grows in uh, the middle of the tongue mm -hmm. of a man eating ogre. Okay, but this ogre is invisible. Uh -oh. Yeah, so it's invisible, yeah. except briefly once, when it's about to snatch a person, you can see its tongue like a flash of lightning, right? So they have to go and fight this invisible foe. They, they don't know, they cannot tell where he is or she is or size or whatever, she's invisible. By the way, I wrote this before the corona. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> By the way, yeah. The invisible. Yeah, yeah, invisible four. Yeah. So, so that's the challenge they, they get. So the whole, in a way, the major part of the, of the epic is of their journey to the mountain mm -hmm. and all the challenges they meet on the way, including the challenge of plucking that hair from mm -hmm. the middle of the tongue of a man eating ogre who mm -hmm. is invisible, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to tell us how then the hair is plucked? Uh, 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 no, no, we have to kind of uh, <laughs> uh, uh, leave that cliffhanger. How about that? Eh? <laughs> Just find out how they did it. Yeah, yeah, so what you're saying is, uh, sorry, my, my daughter is uh, walking around or crawling around. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. Hey, okay, okay, okay. Let her okay. be. Anyway, so. Good uh, idea, uh, okay. Yeah, she should listen. No, she, she can even join in. If yeah, you want to uh, yeah. yeah so, uh, so what you're saying is, you yeah, have like organic feminism, right? Or organic feminism in the, in the tradition of the organic intellectual, right? Um, so, but in your writing, generally speaking, you've always had very strong female characters, um, you know, grain of wheat, a river between, I mean, you can, you know, so, but, um, but I want to make it a little bit more personal and ask you to talk about show, show. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no, you can talk about my mother is very important in my life and I've, yeah, yeah, as, yeah. as your grandmother, you have the same Independent of her hiding bullets of the hiding bullets that are so okay. There's a bit of background. My uncle was part of the Mau Mau. 
so part of part of our family folklore is that um, my grandmother would hate bullets. That my uncle, who was a part of the Kenyan Landed Freedom Army, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yep. Yeah, she. I've written about her. Her name is Wanjiko, and by a whole a whole, a whole memoir uh, called. Well, Oh, can you remind me the title of my memoir of okay. Jairo Guru? Uh, that's why. Uh, uh, we have forgotten. Uh, see, uh, a dream, sorry. sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, it, dreams. dreams in a time of war. Okay. Oh, yes. I, I remember that because I disagreed with the title. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you never told me this. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, dreams in a time of war. You don't. Like yeah. the title, that was a beautiful title. Okay, you can tell us why. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, my mother is at the center of that dreams in a time of war. Mm -hmm. uh, because she is the one who sent me to school. And I can even today, I can never, I didn't understand. I don't know how she came to, to think about my going to school because she herself had not gone to the modern school mm -hmm. and she could not read or write. But I don't know how she read my mind because I'm not the one who articulated. I'm not the one who said, I would like to go to school. Yeah, yeah. She's the one who asked, she asked me, would you like to go to school? Mm -hmm. So I remember that sentence so well mm -hmm. uh, that it's also the, opening sentence of uh, one of my novels, Weep No Child, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she also supervised my homework. Yeah. yeah. Although she couldn't read and write. And the way she did it, I found remarkable later because she would just simply ask me different questions, okay? And yeah. she would have a sense of how I was doing. But her main sentence, which has become a motivation in my life is, mm -hmm. is that the best you can do. In other words, when I told her I got 10 out of 10, mm -hmm. she still would ask, is that the best? Yeah, and I to assure her it was the best. So she ingrained in me the sense of doing the best anyway one can, yeah. okay? That's my mythology. But you have other mythologies in relation to her as your grandmother. <laughs> yeah, no, most definitely. I mean, you know, some of them are you know, I mean, she's one who used to tell us stories, um, you know, especially after we went into exile, she, you know, would go visit her in um, Kenya or and then she would tell us stories, you know, like, essentially folk tales. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, so she was, she is a big, uh, she was a, she also had a certain relationship with her goats. <laughs> her goats would follow her to the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she had goats and they would follow her to the grazing field, but they would not go, they would not touch anybody's garden or eat, and they would just follow <laughs> her <laughs> until they went to the grazing fields, you know. Mm -hmm. She had so and she would make she could grow anything. She had that kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Can do anything now. Um, yeah. So, oh yeah, maybe that's what you. <laughs> so, but but did she influence that kind of genes? Yeah. Did yeah. she influence the writing of, of the of, of the perfect nine? Um, like, was she somewhere in uh, in in the writing? Not so much her, but mm -hmm. in sense of not just my mother now, but think of Kenyan women. Yeah. The role they have played in history. Yeah. Uh, it's really incredible, especially during the, our war of liberation against the mm -hmm. British colonial regime in Kenya. Uh, in of General Mudoni, yeah, led by Kenya Land and Freedom Army, yeah. otherwise misnamed Mau Mau. Uh, women were at the heart of Kenya Land and Freedom Army yeah. because they were everywhere. They mm -hmm. were in the forest fighting. They were, when the men were taken to detention camps, they were left at home, managing the whole the entire home, educating children. At the same time, they were supplying the men and women fighting in the mountains, the guerrilla fighters, 
mm-hmm. they were being fed by the women, so to speak. Yeah. So, uh, no, there's no cutting it. Uh, mm-hmm. Women are very central in Kenyan history, you know. But the our myth of origins, of course, is sent as women mm-hmm. at the center. And our 10 clans, the cool people have 10 clans, and those 10 clans are named after each of the 10 daughters of Wiko and Mombi, who are the subject of this epic, the perfect nine. All right, so maybe, maybe it's a good time. So first, um, I, I, there's some questions coming in. So please keep sending in the questions and then uh, maybe one more reading and then we can turn to, uh, to the questions and comments. That are, I don't know if you can see them far, far but yeah, they're coming oh. in. So one more reading. Uh, is, there a way of see, is there a way of seeing them? Uh, well, I can. I don't know, but I'll read them to you, though. <laughs> OK, yeah, right. Yeah. I'll, I'll censor them. OK, right, I'm talking about censoring them. <laughs> no, don't censor anybody. Just <laughs> <laughs> no censorship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I think you, you had one more passage to read. Um, yeah. Oops. So. No, the question, let me read, uh, uh, yes, I think I, I like to read one. Uh, the, the narrator is, does not actually appear mm-hmm. in the narrative. He just uh, a kind of a voice, okay? Yes, yeah, so, and that reminds me another thing we should discuss is working with, with this poem, like the poetic poem, the epic poem, the, 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 the epic poem as opposed to working with novels, uh, you know, and, and essays and so on and so forth. But um, that can come later. Really. Yeah, 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 I'd like to come to that because uh, this is, uh, as you know, I've been trying to catch up with you. Eh? Oh, well, there is that. Advanced poetry, <laughs> okay. Mokoma has been the poet in the family. <laughs> I know, this, this is such a weird role for me to be on the Yeah, essay. yeah, how many poet, uh, how many books in poetry have you, uh, I think there are two. Only, only two, but still. Okay. Which ones are they? Can I have a... And um, was in consciousness. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah. with those two, he becomes a premier poet in a family. Okay. Yeah, but I only one. I was trembling because <laughs> uh, I've lived in prose all my life. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so now there's a rivalry in a family when it comes to poetry, okay? So I'm sure Mokoma is going to publish a third one. Yeah, I definitely welcome you. I welcome you to the (laughs) (laughs) Welcome. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, it's really wonderful. um, For me, I do not consider myself a poet. So Mm -hmm. this came as a revelation, really, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember clearly, I was sitting by the I live in Irvine. I work at the University of California, Irvine. I'm a distinguished professor of English, not to get coy, but professor of English and comparative literature at oh, UCI. Okay. <laughs> and we are very near the Pacific Ocean. We are 10 minutes away, you know. Yeah. And I was sitting there when this came to me more or less like a Revelation, although I had been reading other epics like uh, Mahabharata and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was a surprise to me when it came in this form, right? Yeah. I just wrote the first sentence and then it started working. <laughs> I played, the only thing I played around with actually was the mm-hmm. 10 and 9. Mm-hmm. Many of the lines are arranged in terms of either 10s or 5s or threes, yeah. that kind of thing. Generally, that was organizing principle, yeah. yeah. But let me tell you about one of the, let me read one about one of the girls. Mm-hmm. This griot, the one who tells the story, yeah. is now to talk about the beauty, each of the nine, each of the 10 girls, you know. And I'm going to read what he says of Wangari, the matriarch of the Gare clan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, this, is a griot. this is a griot talking now, okay? Her clan swears by the name Wangari. She has the courage of a leopard. Her eyes are similarly bright. She has the quickness of a leopard in protecting the powerless from the powerful. She's wily. She once called off work so that people would rest and feast. When they resumed work, they did the work with care, diligence, and love. She once threw a firebrand at a leopard. It ran away and left the herd alone. She says that disagreements that sharpen the mind are the whetstones of life. But the disagreements that sharpen the sword are wet stones of death. Her beauty, okay, her beauty once made a young man cover his hand with cloth so that the warmth from her handshake would not escape or evaporate. Yeah, that's one Gary. But there are similar praise points for each of the girls, yeah. Um, so, okay, why don't we, um, I don't know what time it is. Um, I guess I could find out. But I'm assuming we're doing well time-wise. Okay, six, oh, oh, 640. Um, so, okay, let me read, read some of the questions and then you can respond. Okay. Uh, though I do feel we should talk about Monty Cowboy at some point as an epic. Uh, but we can talk about Monty Cowboy later. <laughs> Well, you can tell them about one cowboy in the family, the family epic, actually. No, I, I, yeah. so, no, I only thought you could actually narrate a quick Monty Cowboy story. Uh, so, okay, well, fact, when I was growing up, when we were growing up with my brothers and, and sisters, um, we had this story that, that was handed down, if you will, from far, far uh, about Monty Cowboy, which actually in a lot of ways is an epic by itself, right? You know, Monty Cowboy was more like a... Like a like an anti-hero, right? The anti-hero kind of figure who would beat up the police and, you know, <laughs> and survive in so many ways. Uh, but one of the stories that I, that I like to tell from Monty Cowboy is of, so one day Monty Cowboy was surrounded by, was surrounded by the, the police. Oh yeah, this is making sense of, the, of the relevance of the story now in, in the times we're in, but anyway, he was surrounded by the police. <laughs> and uh, so what he told them was, uh, why don't you surround me in symmetry, you know, and then I'll count to three. And then when I say shoot, shoot me, and then of course I'll be gone. <laughs> so, so he counted to three and then he ducked. And then the cops shot themselves. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, that's interesting actually talking about this story today. Yeah, but anyway, so but when the cowboy was a mythical, epic kind of, um, story that we have handed down. I tell my I tell yeah. my public stories as well. It's actually surprising that one because that one I told them to I told the story I used to I like telling my children stories as I'm making them up as I go along, you know. Um, and this one I told to my first two sons and the the one who are older than Mokoma. Okay. They were children at the time. And I told them about this wonderful hero, Mwangi cowboy, okay, who could get himself out of any tight situations. Now, and then years later, I was, and then sometimes later I was arrested and put in prison for my work in theater. Mm -hmm. But I did realize when I was away, the older kids were telling the younger ones, Mokoma and the others, the story of one cowboy, and they had their own input into the adventures of Mwangi cowboy. Okay, so the legend lives. Yeah, <laughs> and even even my son who lives in uh, Bion, who lives in Sweden, <laughs> has a version about Mwangi cowboy being cited recently <laughs> in a restaurant in Gothenburg, Sweden, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, but let, let's turn to some of the questions now. Okay, so the first question is from Anonymous Attendee. But it's about translation. Okay, in thinking about translation as a protocol that federates languages, do you see a problem when you write in Latin based alphabet to capture our unique sounds? Could a more native syllabic script help us capture our sounds and therefore our expressions more truthfully? I, I don't know. I just now use the, the uh, because the Koyo people, we don't have a kind of original script in the sense of like the Roman script. Uh, the only form of writing we had was by Gishande poets. Yeah. It was hieroglyphics, but this was only on the gourds, their musical instrument by which they said their poetry. Uh, uh, so uh, I just utilize what we have and the Roman script has been very, very useful uh, to us. Okay. Uh, so we call a language its written form uses the Roman script. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that tomorrow or another day, someone might invent you know, a script which is more appropriate to the sound system. Yeah. But remember, writing is really, uh, uh, they're just symbols. The sound <laughs> itself, the symbol reminds of a sound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so the sound is still the coil the lettering of that sound, but the actual sound, the one you say is, is not affected by the Roman script one or another, okay? Uh, the other thing, in writing this epic, uh, I was really using the structure of the Koya. I wish, I don't have the Koya version here in front of me right now, but the Koya language is very alliterative. Huh? You know, it's used a lot of alliterations, and it's very, very beautiful. So the language itself, when you speak it, mm. it's almost like a, it's like music itself. Yeah, because the alliterations, okay. Uh, and I, I use that a lot in the epic. Now, the problem is rendering mm. that musicality in English was a real challenge, <laughs> right? You lost it in the English. Uh -huh. I think that musicality of is slightly lost, but what you try to do mm. in translation, at least for me, is try to create as much as you can the spirit of the other, okay? Yeah. I cannot really produce the sound of a coin in English. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only try to render its spirit in English, okay? Right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so okay, then, then the second question is okay, in chapter two of the book, Kedamo Yihori, Perfect Nine, Gogi writes that Tene na tene, or Tene na tene na tene ni tene omue. Okay, so and then he goes on, okay, I think this translates to past time and future time is the same time. Okay, please explain what this means. Is this related to the block universe theory in physics that asserts that the flow of time is an illusion, that the events of the past and the future are as real as the present of uh, uh, as real as the present time. Thanks. Well, maybe I don't know to claim too much, but I know when I was uh, before I wrote this, Mokoma himself was talking to me a lot about physics. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my physics. <laughs> so there are a lot of physics in this. I, I presume I don't know really, no, but there is what I can say about the, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the epic as in most epics, is very much aware of the connection in nature, the connectives mm -hmm. in nature. It doesn't see human being as separate from nature in a sense of, I'm the master of nature, you know. Uh, the awareness of rivers, the awareness of mountains, you know, the awareness of animals, the awareness of uh, 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 birds and so on. Uh, it's very, very important in this, you know, uh, in this, you know, uh, uh, epic, yeah. yeah. So, but is, is there, is there a, a close relationship between the epic and magical realism in terms of time? Because in magical realism, then you have the same flow of time, right? Time doesn't... Yeah, but, you know, uh, still speaking, all mythologies mm -hmm. uh, of any kind, they have this magical 
realism in them. Mm -hmm. You know, African stories have a lot of magical realism. You know, uh, I remember one myth among the, not myth, but story among the Koyo, mm -hmm. where one child is born out of the knee of a man. Oh, yeah, you know, so born from a neck of a, of a bird or things yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, so in, in, in Mahabharata, one of the in epics, again, this is the same magical realism, which you find also in Greek uh, yeah. uh, uh, literature. And for those, you may not be a Christian or whatever, but, or, or Judaist in terms of uh, religion, mm -hmm. but the Old Testament, which was my first book, which I read, mm -hmm. uh, because it was the only book available in the Koyo language when I learned to read yeah. and write. Yeah. It's full of magical realism. You know, you can read in a religious way or you can read in a secular way and either way is full of magical realism. Yeah, and enjoyable actually, yeah. Yeah, like, and very, you can't keep it down. You know, the whole idea of Jonah for one of the prophets being uh, swallowed yeah. by a fish yeah. <laughs> uh, and then it's uh, being vomited out on the yeah. island, you know, yeah. to, to, to do his prophecy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for me, that was, oh my God, this is possible. And so m magical realism is inherent really in all mythologies, okay, yeah. whether African, European or Asian, mm. yeah. All right, so then Bono has another question. Um, so I suppose um, it, Alan will tell us how, to, how, we, how we're doing this game. But anyway, Bono has another question. My previous, so he says, my previous question links nicely with Goge's view that time travel is possible every time we, we recollect a memory, right? But this is only time travel in the backward direction. What about in the forward direction? In other words, can you travel forwards? He's following up on the physics. Oh, yeah. Actually, there is. Well, okay, let me come to the question of physics. Um, uh, physics, apart from arguing with Mokoma about physics, not arguing, but he was telling about physics. Uh, mm -hmm. My daughter, Mombi, we also used to argue about, uh, not argue, but talk about the concept of one. Uh, one being the foundation of many, you know, and everything begins with one or whatever. And I don't know how we argued about numbers and so on, you know. Uh, yeah, so, so Alan says we have about 10 minutes. Uh -huh. Oh, 10 minutes. Oh, so what, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, so it's a uh, question, can, can, you, can you travel? Okay. So oh you, yes, among uh, the core uh, language has this concept of time, not as linear, not as linear time, mm -hmm. or like circular time. You know, mm -hmm. so we talk about the past, ten mm -hmm. past, but it's also, the past of the past. Mm. Tene wa tene. That's past of the past. Mm. But we are similar in the future. Tene as future. Uh, uh, and you can say tene na tene forever. Yeah. Tene na tene, but as oh, future. Yeah. So we have this tene and then tene wa tene, past of the pa past, past of the past. And also future of the future. Yeah. I thought to work in Igiko, it works language quite quite well. You know, uh, well, in, so, uh so there, yeah. there are some really good questions here. So the other one is from Rehe Makifogi. Um uh -huh. okay, I remember hearing about how Yekoyo men fathers were asked how many children they have, they would answer uh Does that apply to families that have children that are less than nine? Oh, <laughs> Uh, what they, in terms of Koyo people, at least traditionally, they never really counted. They never liked to count, even the cat, either the cattle or goats, they will never tell you the exact number. <laughs> yeah. They will always say another number, probably less. <laughs> okay, did you count your books? So if you, are, <laughs> if you have six, if you have six, you may say you have five. You can't have any books you have written. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I can't sell you the whole. 
<laughs> All right, so don't do a that. Few, uh, yeah, a few number. Yeah. Okay, so I found it really interesting that the numbers nine in the novel is related to the previous question. Um, so I found it really interesting that the numbers nine in the novel as perfect and divine, and the number seven, devilish but evil, have a have a reverse meaning to what I'm used to, as I'm used to the number seven being divine and nine being related to evil bad. So who is sorry? Can you say that again, please? Yeah, so it's a question of, of, of why why nine. Like not why nine is perfect and for the anonymous certain D. Oh, okay. Is like, why nine as opposed to seven or ten or yeah. Let me, let me, let me once again explain. It's to do with numbers. In mm -hmm. Igiko, we say keda muyuru, huh? because yeah. you don't want to say ten, that they had ten daughters, the, yeah. the exact number. So you say they were nine. But they were not exactly nine, they were more than nine, they were ten. So you say. Keda Moyuru. Yep. The perfect nine. So yep. perfect here is used in the context of uh, full nine. Yeah. Which is ten. Huh? Okay. Yep. The perfect it's, it's nine like, means ten. It's like, uh, like the, in the US, they talk about the, is it called the farmer's dozen? The farmer's dozen. So if you're buying 12 eggs, you get 13. As, uh, anyway, okay. Okay. So the next question. <laughs> Okay, I don't know about that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have chicken, so I've, I've had to learn this stuff. But um, okay, what do you say about the colonizing the mind? This is from uh, Teferi, Teferi Tafa. Okay, what do you say about the colonizing the mind? Do you think African minds are liberated? Uh, then a follow-up question. I can see the impact of Mao. I'm assuming it's Mao Zedong in your work. How has it affected your life? And then the third one. Uh, follow up question is what is the status of uh, literature in African languages? Oh, let me try one. Can you face the first one? Oh, it's okay, I'll start with the first one then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What do you say about decolonizing the mind? Do you think the African mind is liberated? No, we are, it's a struggle, really. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, sometimes it's easier to see what to see economic oppression mm -hmm. or political oppression, but sometimes harder to detect uh, colonization of the mind. Mm -hmm. It takes harder to remove the colonialism of the mind. Okay, we have to struggle. And the first thing in our struggle is our languages. Uh, let me just, I don't want to give a whole lecture because I've written a lot about this, but let me just put it this way. Whatever any people have colonized another, the first thing they do is suppress the language of the colonized and put their own language as the language which everybody must learn. It happened in Ireland among the Irish. It happened to Native Americans. It happened to Maori New Zealand. It happened to Asian people. Wherever there was colonialism, the first thing any colonial power did was mm -hmm. to suppress the language of the people. Because when the language, when you suppress the language of the people, you are suppressed also their memory, their sense of being, and so on. So the first thing we have to do is recover our language. So let me say this and let me sum it up. I've said this over and over again, and I'll say it again, that if you know all the languages of the world mm -hmm. and you don't know your mother tongue or the language of your culture, that is enslavement. Mm -hmm. But if you know your mother tongue or the language of your culture and add to it all the languages of the world, mm -hmm. that is empowerment. Okay. Uh, we are talking, we shall become the color when we, this, we get our full empowerment, mm -hmm. when we can control our resources and then connect to the world on the basis of equal give and take. So mm -hmm. I'm not talking about isolation, I'm talking about the base from which we, uh, we connect with other people, yeah. Uh, so then the other question, then, then I think we have to, we have to be brief because there's another, I, I just look at the questions and there, there are so many interesting questions. Um, but anyway, but I, but I like the question um, that, that the ferry has here because um, it keeps coming up. Uh, Mao Zedong or Marxism in your work? Um, oh. <laughs> you know, you're a communist. Uh, 
No, I might give words to, to, the, to the question, but if you just ask uh, the impact of Mao in your work. Yeah, let me just say, first of all, Marx is very, very important. And you must, everybody should ask themselves, why are capitalists afraid of Marx? Mm. Why do they spend so much time and money and propaganda and everything else to ensure that people don't read Karl Marx? <laughs> And with the US politics, I mean, now, US because, politics. No, 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 I'm just saying it's generally true. So I'm saying Marx, mm -hmm. but the most important thing about Marx is the, di the process of thing called dialectics. Yeah. Yeah, dialectical thinking is what's crucial to both Marx and also Mao, okay? Mm -hmm. Because Mao learned from Marx. The importance of Mao is because he came from, not from Europe, but from the other side, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, from an oppressed nation, so to speak, at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So dialectics, the Koyo language, the one I have, is so many ways dialectical in thinking. Mm -hmm. We talk about, we don't talk about greeting a person, we talk about kogaidania, boteidania, huh? mm -hmm. helping one another. It's as if, yeah. Well, it's not you do it to another person, that you, both of you, <laughs> doing yeah. it together. Kogeidania. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, many other things have to do with dialectical thinking embodied in a co language. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, then, then there are another two related questions. This is from Arthur Freeman, but um, okay, in linguistic circles, I think that, that hierarchy of languages that privileges colonial languages is breaking down. I hope that's true. Am I too optimistic? In other words, where are we in the... Yeah, in... in, in no, in Africa, European of... language are still the languages of power. Huh? Yeah. Right. In Kenya, although we have got Kiswahili and other, and other African languages, you know, but English is still the language of power, although it's spoken by only 10% of the population. Yeah. It's the oh. language of government, it's the language of administration, it's the language of commerce, okay? Yeah, this is I, recommend, um... African languages until recently were not even taught in schools, yeah. you know? Kids don't read African language books, okay? So they are trained to think, to evaluate themselves in terms of glory of English, you know, uh, are not, African languages are inglorious. In Kenya, they even use the word shrub. Is it shrub they yeah, use? Shrub, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you talk English with a, an African, affected by your African accent, like I speak English with my Kikuyu accent, so to speak, mm -hmm. they will say, I'm shrubbing, the Kikuyu cool language, mm -hmm. shrubbing, I'm bringing bush into the English, <laughs> yeah. And these African kids saying this to each other. Yeah. And each other as well. Yeah. You know, um, you know it's, it's very, very dangerous. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I was gonna say this. One more thing I'd like to say, because I think I'd like to see African government banning criminalization of African languages on the school compound. Even today, some kids in Africa schools are beaten, punished, if they are caught speaking an African language in the school compound. This is criminal, you know. So uh, yeah. African governments are criminalizing African languages. And that's a that child abuse in the yeah. So this is why I recommend my book, uh, The Rise of the African Novel, because <laughs> because it's really a meditation on the on the, on the language question as well. Uh, and, and in that book I talk about the English metaphysical empire, right? Which is to say that that in terms of aesthetics and power and yeah that it, it's still english but um okay so the next thing is a compliment saying that my son is a huge uh fan he read the river between so that's a compliment but here's another here's a question um from the right let just say this there's a young lady in kenya i think her name is kibugi huh? yeah. yep. who i'm very impressed i never met her but I'm very impressed with her because mm -hmm. she more or less asked her father, mm -hmm. the professor at Nairobi University, I've never met them, 
to teach her Ikoyo. And her father has obliged by employing a mm. teacher, private teacher, to teach this young lady mm. Ikoyo. So to me, that's a very good example of what we can be, mm. you know, uh, and I'm very proud of her. By yeah, the way, yeah. I think for the younger generations, I think the, far, the, the more for the generations that are more removed from colonial education, the more liberated they feel in terms of understanding or, or even questioning why they cannot speak their languages at home or in schools and so on and so forth. Right? You know, so for the young ones, if, even my daughter Nyambura, the other day just asked me if you can, if you can, um, you know, if I can get a queer teacher because one of our friends is is, is learning Russian. Um, but, uh, but here's a question from Jerome Karaja. Uh, please say something about technology and how it both amplifies and silences, uh, silences languages depending on how they are related by the powers that be. As artificial intelligence is taking over the most of social domains, what do we start to amplify or silence in our native languages? What worries you that we should be most cautious of? So yeah, so the question of technology and you know the internet and yeah, we should use technology. Technology is very important. First of all, technology has always been part of our lives. You know, in a in a in a perfect nine, I do talk about technology <clears throat> because these women had to make weapons. Okay, they had to hunt. They didn't just hunt with their hands. <laughs> they use weapons. Yeah, that's technology. Technology is that which extends the power of the human body, okay? Yeah. That's technology, yeah. It enables us to do so many things. So we should see technology mm -hmm. and use it creatively. Yeah. If we use it within a colonial mindset, then of course, <laughs> technology will be against us. Yeah. Uh, but if we use it with a liberated mindset, then it will be for us, right? So yeah. for instance, a good example, there was a time when we were publishing books, unless you got an English publisher, there was no way of publishing our own book. But today, for instance, because of technology, somebody can write a blog in a coil, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. And to be read, one can do self-publishing if necessary. It may be a bit hard for on the pocket, but these things are now possible because of technology, right? Yeah. I've seen a lot of filmmakers now in uh, in the Koyo mm -hmm. uh, language, another African language. You go to YouTube, you find a lot of documentaries in yeah. African languages. And that's because technology now enables us to do that, the so YouTube, for instance. So we make use of them from a liberated mind. If you don't use from a liberate the mind, it means it, it will make us prisoners rather than liberating us, okay? Yeah, so, okay, two, two last questions. Um, or, or this oh, one. I say, use technology, don't let technology use you. And I say the same thing of English. Use English, yeah. don't let I use you, all right? Use it, mm. uh, don't let abuse you. Okay. So there's a comment from Masu, Masu Amboy where, where she's saying that our perfect nine would be great in a comic book form. But here's a question though from anonymous attendee. So and this this will be second to last question. Uh, any decolonial Christian Kenyan African literature that you that you recommend? Uh, Christian Christian Kenyan African literature that you that you recommend? Well, I think you okay. Okay. Even from the Bible itself, we can learn a lot. Huh? Yeah. But not, uh, but not the way Christianity is used to oppress people, huh? right? Mm -hmm. When you think of Jesus, Jesus was a carpenter. He was a worker, right? Or his father was a carpenter, a worker. He worked with fishermen, ordinary men and women, right? You know, so think of, religion and a working class empowering the working people. Yeah, uh, the story of Jesus in the uh, in the den of thieves. Huh? So Jesus was anti-capitalist in a way that you could read him as uh, Yeah, he went and for, you know, felt how temples 
were being misused, yeah. right? Just like churches in Kenya or other countries are being used by a priest who won't make money. Uh, mm -hmm. The more you can make your priest richer and have several cars and beautiful houses, even though you guys are poor, the more mm -hmm. of a... <laughs> yeah. No, please read the Bible again or any religious text for that matter. Yeah. The emphasis, the ordinary working person. It's the same thing with the Quran and women. At the yeah. time when Muhammad came to power, into being, women were really very oppressed in that part of the world. Huh? Yeah. And he, he came with a view that allowed for more liberation of women. Uh, look at uh, Buddhism again. You know, the idea of loving one another, the idea that power comes from the people, from the only working person. Yeah. yeah, not the other way around. But the term religion, it means that power comes from the rich and the powerful <laughs> and the exploiter, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. So then the last, the last question is uh, from, from Janice Buck, uh, my mother-in-law. Uh, <laughs> And she, she says, uh, okay, when you have responded to all these serious questions, might you consider singing to us? You have a, you have a lovely voice. So, oh, and by singing a song. Well, <laughs> it's the first time I've heard of my singing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. The first time I'm hearing my voice being capable of singing. Yeah. You might turn yeah, it right? into a professional singer. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't really have a song. Mm. Let me see. When Iko and Mombi mm. are put on the mountain, so they reach the top of the mountain, the moon, Mount Kenya, yeah. they see all the land in front of them, and they are speechless with wonder, OK? Yeah. So they sing something like this. I may not sing that. I don't have the words, you know. Then they sing, Mwene nyaga netoa and so on and so forth, yeah. But I don't have the words, I would just... Uh... <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it did sound good. I was, I was skeptical about your singing until I, you know, but that, that was quite good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you went to accompany me when singing? <laughs> uh, no, 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 no that, 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 that was perfect, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you. Yeah. Uh, yep. uh, so I guess um, as the moderator, um, unless Alan wants to say something in closing. Uh, oh, I just wanted to thank you both so much. That was, it was just fantastic to have you here with politics and prose and like a beautiful conversation. And music from both of you was just fantastic. Oh, yeah, it's going to be singing. I've become a yeah. singer. My next yeah. career is going to be please book places for my next gig somewhere as a singer. Uh, we, we, need, we need to do it as a gig, actually. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, get on Broadway, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. why not, mm -hmm. actually? Yeah. 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 Oh. Well, thank you both, uh, Gogi Watiango and Mukomo Wag. Kogi, it's like so fantastic having you here tonight. Really appreciate it. No, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I hope you enjoy and the perfect nine. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. everyone, everyone needs to purchase a copy. The links in the chat is beautiful. Like the layout, everything is just like it's like Oh, you, you know, it, maybe you, you, should ask, you should ask Papa to talk about, because you are so impressed by the layout. Maybe you should talk a little bit about the excitement. Actually, he called his like, you can't believe what I just got in the mail today. You cannot believe what I got in the mail today. <laughs> yeah, it's actually very, uh, no, no, I, I was very excited, really. I said, it's like a candy, you know, jumping about and, and looking at it and yeah. opening it. It's as if I had never published a book before, right? <laughs> <laughs> the way I was doing even the core version is very, the core original is very well produced. Yeah. yeah. And it's selling very well in Kenya. People say African mm. language books don't sell, but in Kenya, Kedamo Yuru is selling very well. Yeah. 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 yeah the new press did a fantastic job. Yeah. 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 Thank you. yeah. yeah. They did that. Yeah.
absolutely yeah, yeah. Hmm. well thank you both so much it's it's time it's time for us to uh to sign off but i just want to thank everyone for being here and uh gogi and uh mukoma both of you as well so and alan by the way i should say you are shot i'm very impressed by your shot uh, thank, thank you <laughs> thank you you told me it's from ghana and your mother made it yeah, for you. yeah yeah exactly yeah right yeah yeah not from ghana mm -hmm. yeah. all right thank you all thank everyone for being here and um have a good night and stay stay well read okay thank you yeah. thank you thank you mukoma